So again, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 32nd IEEE Agricultural Robotics and Automation Technical Committee webinar. Today, uh, we are honored to have a talk by Dr. and Professor Carrick Detweiler from the Institute of Nebraska Lincoln here in the United States. Carrick is an assistant professor uh, there in Nebraska and he's going to talk today about bringing aerial robots closer to crops, sensing, sampling, and safety. As all of you know, unmanned aerial vehicles um, are literally, and no pun intended, they are taking off very rapidly uh, in many, many applications. Here in the US, there have been more than 2,000 uh, applications approved by the Federal Aviation Administration. And one of the applications that's drawing a lot of interest is agriculture. Uh, there are lots of challenges uh, at, related to using many aerial vehicles to collect data and how to use that data for precision agriculture. And more than that, how to fly close to the crops, how to ensure the safety of the aircraft, the crop, the people. And going beyond that, how to use those vehicles to do manipulation tasks such as collecting water samples and even uh, recharging uh, remotely deployed sensors. And that's all part of the work that Carrick and his group are doing in Nebraska. And um, again, it's an honor to have them today come and share that story with us. Carrick is an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Lincoln at the Computer Science and Engineering Department. He comes from the MIT, uh, famous CS, uh, CSAO lab, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Uh, Carrick, he is uh, a young faculty, but already um, received uh, important awards and has received funding from both, both the NSF and USDA uh, in particular, the prestigious uh, National Robotics Initiative uh, grant to further his work in agricultural robotics. So with that, let me ask you guys just once more, please go to the Join Me app, click on the person icon, change where it says viewer to your name, so we know um, who are the, are the colleagues who are joining every month. And I'm happy to inform that just doing the introduction, we've jumped to 26 uh, participants today, which is a fantastic number, among the highest we've had uh, in the recent uh, time. Uh, so Carrick, it's looking like uh, there's a lot of interest from people all over the world. Um, so with that, I'm gonna ask people just once more to mute their phone or mic and use the magic of join me to give Carrick the presentation rights. Carrick, you there? Maybe you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, great. So, and let me just get this started, hopefully. Okay, and are my slides showing properly now? Okay, so can you hear me and see my slides? Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you and see those slides in, in full screen. Okay, great, thank you. So um, thanks for the great introduction. So as I said, my name is Carrick Detweiler and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And what I wanna talk about today is really really how, how some of the projects we're doing in my lab, the Nimbus lab, related to UAVs, aerial robots, and, and really um, the first, Part of my talk will be focused on agriculture and then I'll um, get into a project on water quality that we've also been working on that's also related to kind of the water side of agriculture. But first what I really wanted to do is start out by you know, asking, you know, what are UAVs used for? And 
and a lot of people now the perceptions are changing, but still a lot of people think about you know these types of big drones dropping bombs in in Afghanistan. Um, but of course, what we're going to be talking about is much more you know these types of drones. So the drones that we're using in agriculture, um, and and we're seeing a proliferation of these types of vehicles. And a lot of what's happening with these types of vehicles is, as this kind of video shows, is they're really good at flying high, collecting images, you know, using remote sensing techniques to, to basically observe different locations. So you saw a video of the Platte River, which is a big river in Nebraska. And this is the salt marsh area also in Nebraska, um, you know, that has a lot of kind of interesting characteristics. A couple of endangered species lives, live here. Um, but while these aerial images, you can get a lot out of them, what my research is mostly focused on is really kind of these low flying. So what can you do when you, instead of flying high, start flying low? And in part, there are a lot of challenges in robotics and how do you get really close. But you can also see, so this is that same salt marsh, but now when you get really close, you can see that there are these little you know, bubbles in the ground where there, there are little, you know, animals and other, other types of processes going on. So I think there's a lot of advantages to getting close into the environment. And of course, if you get close, uh, my hope is that, you know, maybe we'll be able to do other interesting things like collect samples. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is really some of the, um, you know, how do you get closer into the environment and interact with the environment? And I think a lot of this is that when you're close to the environment, you really need to uh, improve the autonomy of the vehicle. So GPS is great when you're flying high, you can program great paths. And this is, I mean, this is what's happening now and really starting to revolutionize remote sensing for agriculture. But I think that the next generation of, of systems will really be about getting closer. And, and we really need to improve the autonomy but also the, the reliability and safety of these systems. So um, I guess, as, as was mentioned, you know, this is definitely, I want this to be an informal talk, so if anybody has questions, feel free to you know, type them in the chat window or, or unmute your microphone and, and ask so that we can, I'd, I'd love interactions in the talk as well. So what I'm gonna mainly talk about today are uh, you know, this kind of crop height estimation and row following work that we've been doing here at UNL. Um, but then, uh, depending on how time is going, I'll talk about some other projects in the lab, including some of this aerial water sampling, how we am, are working to improve the, the safety of all these kind of robot systems interacting with the environment, and also a kind of wireless power transfer project to, that we're developing to basically be able to charge sensors that are in remote fields or other locations. So really the motivation that is driving this work is, is more on the kind of smaller scale um, phenotyping trials, where basically we're collaborating with a number of agronomists here at UNL and elsewhere who are doing phenotyping. So they're planting many genetic varieties of plants, and they want to really you know, improve their understanding of how, how water and nitrogen stress impact the different varieties of plants. And we're again interested in, you know, what new types of things can we do when we start to fly close to the environment? And one of the, the things that we're looking at is so using active sensors. So instead of, uh, for instance, just passively measuring the, um, how the light is reflected off of the plants, you know, perhaps you can fly at night really low with, you know, actively emitting a known wavelengths and use those to, to better measure the health and status of the crops. And the other thing that we're looking at and that I'll start out by talking about is actually crop height. So it turns out that crop height, even early in growing, is a, a good indicator of what the final yield will be. And mainly the work that I've been doing is on maize, so corn, in, in which is one of the primary agricultural products in Nebraska. Um, but crop height for corn and other plants can also, you know, be a good indicator of stress and plant health. This is one of the things that's almost never collected regularly in, in these phenotyping trials 
Um, they will, as you see in this picture, at the end of, of growing, they'll end up you know, manually going out in the field and measuring the height of, of all these plants to see how the different phenotypes um, ended up growing. Um, but it's almost never done commercially. And it's really never, you know, you never see this done weekly because it's in, even in uh, research settings because it's such a labor intensive process. So this is one of the first things that we've been working on automating. And our approach is to use a small UAV, small drone that is equipped with a laser scanner flying very close to the crops. So as you can see in this picture, we're gonna fly just as close as we can to the crops because we have this laser scanner that's basically going to, in a single plane, measure um, the ranges to both the ground, but also to all the plants. And as you see in this, um, this image, basically uh, to, you rarely will see the ground and you'll see lots of leaves and, and other features of the, of the plants, but occasionally you see the ground and, and we wanna fly close again because uh, given the resolution of our, our laser scanner, the closer you fly, the more likely you'll you'll basically be able to see points on the ground, and and our our goal is really to use this to extract crop height. And of course, the challenges are that you know we're flying close, we're we have very noisy data. It's while you know these are all nicely planted in rows, and we'll we'll leverage that. We're it's still a pretty unstructured environment, and. And we need to really make sure that we can actively control it because it's really hard to go out and fly um, really close to the tops of these crops. You basically can't do it manually for more than you know maybe a, a few tens of meters before you crash into it. So just a few more details on the system. Uh, so we're the system we're using is the Ascending Technologies Firefly, which is a hex rotor UAV. That's about a 600 gram gram payload, and we're using a Hokoyu laser scanner that gives us data at 36 hertz and has a relatively short range, so 5.6 meters. And this is one of the less expensive laser scanners, built high quality, um, because basically, with you know, with this we can get get good data um, and we can fly. And since we're flying close, we don't need a long range scanner. We also have Eric, uh, allow me to interrupt you for just one yeah. second. Someone did not mute your phone and it's disturbing the call. Uh, everybody, please mute your phone right now. This is very important. It's very disturbing when other people are disturbing our speaker. Thank you. Uh, carry, carry on. Yep. Yeah, so we also have onboard processing. So we're doing all of the, the data collection and analysis online. We also have a camera on board that we're using to collect data, although we're we're not using it in the in the actual control that I'll be talking about. But just to give you an idea of kind of what this data looks like, so this is an example of a laser scan, basically flying over the crops. So so the the kind of you know yellow and and more blue points you see, those are actually, and I can just pause this video. Um, so, so those points are the points that are are closer to the vehicle, and you know one thing. So, you know this is pretty noisy. You can see that as you kind of go out. So, I guess top or bottom um, of the screen, but kind of laterally from the vehicle, you get fewer um, basically sensor readings because some of them are blocked. You're just seeing seeing less there. Um, and from this type of data, our goal is really to extract the crop height. Now, um, now I won't go into kind of the mathematical details, but I want to just give you kind of a, an overview of how we do this. So we have um, these noisy scan scans. We also have information from the inertial measurement unit of the vehicle, because as you might you might imagine as the vehicle is kind of pushed around both as we're flying it but also as winds come along uh, the pitch and roll are going to change basically how our our laser that's kind of point mounted in this downward looking configuration 
will will be read. So one of the first steps is just to um, do the transformation of the coordinate frames. And then what we're doing is basically uh, we have a number of filters to, to basically reject outliers. And we tend to, we found that just using kind of median filters works well because we do get some kind of strong outliers, but for the most part, the kind of middle section of the data works well. We're then um, fusing this with a Kalman filter and and doing a kind of a bunch of other things. And, and we, we basically end up having two processes where we're estimating the where we see the bottoms of the crops and where we see the tops of the crops. And we can use that then uh, just basically taking the difference between those to estimate the crop heights. Now, um, I can show you a kind of brief video of the, this flying. So this is, um, hopefully this video is showing up okay for you all, but basically this is us controlling the X and Y coordinate, but automated height control. So just flying back and forth over the crops. And, and we've done, done a number of these tests and we've found this to be a quite effective both at autonomous height control and also being able to extract the height of the, of the crops. So uh, we did an experiment where we you know, collected data with our approach. We also went out and manually um, had our agronomist colleagues measuring the height of the, the crops with their, their big meter stick that they normally use. And we came within three centimeters of the, of the manual measurements. And basically we think, I mean, we're within the, what we, we think is the error of the manual measurement. So, so with the system, we're able to quite quickly collect the, the crop height information. And, and we can also, we're flying with autonomous height control. So we're using the data that we get. Uh, really, we're only seeing the ground, typically maybe three to 5% of the, of the laser scans hit the ground. Um, but that's enough. We can we can filter all this data using kind of that the flow diagram I showed before to measure the height using this. Now, again, feel free to ask questions if you if you have questions. Um, but one of the challenges is that uh, that what we you know we so we got this working fairly well, um, flying good height control. One of the first things we um, discovered, which is not not particularly unexpected, but was that we really, while we can can do good height control, GPS is not sufficient to actually be able to follow the rows with the precision we need. So now I want to talk a little bit about some some relatively recent work we've done in actually automating the row following, again using the laser scanner. And the reason we need to do this is because uh, most of these phenotyping trials, they're They'll basically plant a couple, typically two, maybe three rows of the same genetic variety um, next to each other, and there'll be maybe you know a 10 meter long row of those, and then they'll they'll switch to the next genetic variety, and so so basically they have these very small um, number of plants for each one, relatively speaking. So we can't just kind of fly down this and and collect the collect the height because we won't know which row it's from with kind of GPS accuracy. Um, of course, you know, there are other options like using RTK GPS. Um, there are some now, uh, to, uh, some companies are starting to develop these very lightweight receivers for RTK that are small enough to fly in a UAV. Um, but talking with kind of our, our collaborators here, you know, they're, they're going to different sites you know they don't want to necessarily set up a new base station at each each site. Uh, they don't integrate the current systems don't uh, the small lightweight systems don't integrate with the existing RTK systems that they have for the tractors. So so basically we're trying to get away from having to do some of this setup and adding payload to it. So what we're gonna what we've um, been doing is actually using the data from the laser scanner again to estimate where, you know, basically to be able to follow the rows. So 
Um, again, I'm not going to go into the kind of mathematical details of it, but let me try to give you a kind of hopefully an intuitive idea of how we're doing this. And the way we're doing this is really we are leveraging um, the idea that we know uh, how closely the rows are planted. So they're planted you know, at a precise distance apart. So if you look at the top right image here, this is kind of what a raw laser scan looks like. Um, but if we can exploit some of the kind of the known geometry, so on the left you can see uh, the, the corn plants, and basically one of the first steps that we do is we basically say, okay, we expect the plants to be you know, a certain distance apart, and then we can do kind of a sliding window approach where we test different hypotheses, which you know which bins, whether it's the yellow, the red, or the the blue, contain the actual plants. And so then in this bottom left plot, you can see after doing this process and testing it, we can filter out a lot of the data. So in that bottom left plot, we can see these are the points that remain um, that had the kind of the in terms of this kind of voting scheme, the most likely points to correspond to the stocks. And and we have to do, again, a fair amount of other filtering to be able to say, okay, this is, you know, this is the actually kind of the center of the plant versus you know, just the leaf. There's a, a lot of challenges that you can think about when, for instance, you may maybe, uh, you know, if you're close to a leaf that's kind of bent down, you'll only see the leaf and not nothing else. So we're doing a lot of a lot of processing here. But ultimately, what we then do is, so this picture on the bottom left is three rows, and if you then merge those points by the row offset, and that's shown kind of by these blue points on the right-hand plot, those are, that basically, shifting by the row offset, we can then get an estimate of you know, where we are relative to the row and, and use that for actually our location estimate. And and so this is, um, here are some kind of showing results. So we actually, the kind of last of the corn in our, our test plot here was harvested about a week ago. So we've been, been doing a lot of flying and data collection up until just about a week ago. So um, we have to actually compare, get ground truth estimates. But the plot on the right shows um, basically our our row following. And if you look closely, um, at least for for those of us who have spent a lot of time looking at this, these resu results look pretty good. And also um, following, looking at the vehicle flying, we're able to follow, follow the rows fairly well, even into kind of these five meter per second winds, which of course is not a really windy day, but it definitely is good enough for, you know, most days, at least in Nebraska, in the mornings and evenings we'll have, have winds that are, are less than this. And and basically we were able to, through a lot of this um, data processing and filtering, we were able to follow the rows while also actively maintaining height control. So really our goal and what we've achieved is really closing the loop so that um, you don't need to use, use GPS, you can just rely on on the laser scan data and tell it to follow a row. It'll follow a row, maintain the height, and and that really, you know, reduces the kind of what the operator needs to do when flying this. So, and kind of future work on 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 this. So we're working right now on on analyzing. Unfortunately, we don't have a great ground truth system, so we're basically looking at videos we captured and and analyzing you know, how often it, it drifted off the row and whether it was able to return. And, um, and in the future, we definitely, uh, I guess one of the key things is this year, we were able to basically follow and measure rows. We want to basically extend this to being able to um, measure whole fields. So this is basically requiring precise switching between rows and knowing kind of where rows end in the field. And of course, there's a lot of, um, other factors we we definitely need to evaluate. So, as the the corn or perhaps other other row crops as they grow, uh, we need to test how well our, our algorithms work 
under different growing conditions. Uh, of course, wind is a key feature. Lighting as well. So um, fortunately, the, if you've worked with laser scanners before, they don't always work well outdoors. What we found is that in this downward facing configuration, unless the sun is really right on the horizon and and pointing into the the scanner, uh, we don't don't see problems with it being you know oversaturated. It tends to work well in these environments, but it's definitely another thing we need to consider. So, well, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about a couple other projects, but I don't know. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? You can type them or speak them. Okay, so question is, what about um, crops where you can't really see the rows anymore, like fully grown sugar beets? Um, that's a really good question. So um, we've really focused mainly on maize or corn here. And I think, I think we could extract some information. Uh, we may not be able to know kind of the crop height, but as long as you know there's some some taller part of the plant, and if they're planted in rows, we should be able to follow the rows. Um, so you can think of this as kind of mounds of dirt. Okay, and so then another question is, what is the reaction of farmers this, uh, using UAVs for phenotyping? So at least the kind of researchers, the who are the ones doing most of the phenotyping, uh, they're they're really excited about this type of technology. And in part, the um, things like just getting crop height is something that you know they never really never do, except you know very occasionally during the growing season for particular projects, and then at the end. Um, but you know there's there are some of these works that show that this is actually an important characteristic and. And if they can do it, you know, by pressing a button and spending spending an hour instead of 20 hours, I think they, at least the people here, would like to use this, you know, on a weekly weekly basis. Um, that said, we're I think another we're also we're not sure about kind of these low flying vehicles for production. It's not clear. Um, I mean, that we can cover these huge huge farms fast enough for kind of these large scale grown grown systems. Um, but there may be uses where, you know, from a high flying UAV, you identify a potential problem area and then you go down and and use um, use the other other, you know, this type of sensor to zoom in. Um, okay, so another question, let's see. In the case where the UAV drifts to the next row, how does it return to the initial row? Yeah, so this was actually one of the big challenges, and um, yeah, we'll we'll be publishing some papers on this shortly that go into much more of the kind of mathematics and details. But one of the big challenges was this, you know, basically if you get blown off a row, how do you get back? And it turns out in our control we were fairly loose, so we allow ourselves to drift by you know, half a row or even a row. But what we're doing is basically um, maintaining an estimate of which row we're on. So we have, we set our initial row, like, okay, you're over the row we want to follow. And we're able to detect that we drift off. So, so far, um, that's been fairly effective, even in, in places where, like, some of the rows are damaged and they're missing plants, um, is we're tracking a few rows um, with each scan. I guess another question here is, are you planning to combine the laser scanner with other sensors in the in the future? So like R RGB cameras. So, so yeah, so right now we do have a camera that's just downward facing and we're collecting all of that. We're we have some, you know, ideas of what we want to do with it, both from kind of the agronomy side and doing the analysis, mm -hmm. but also um looking Looking at using it, you know, implementing optical flow to further refine the row following. Um, now, the other thing that we're interested in is these these more active sensors. So, um, you know, basically sensors that the agronomists are using to, you know, on that are mounted that can be mounted on tractors to measure the height, measure different canopy properties, um, but don't work well when they're they're far away. Um, so these are some of the things we're 
we're looking at integrating as well to collect you know really high resolution data about these especially about these phenotype trials so I guess there's another question on how fast can we fly and how long does it take to do a row so so right now um, we typically fly in kind of the range of about uh, two to five meters per second um, so you can cover you know row fairly fast our flights can only with this particular vehicle we have about a 15 maybe 20 minute flight time so definitely um, and again we've been doing kind of rows at a time so I don't, don't have off the top of my head kind of how long it would take to do a, a quarter section field or something but um, but we think you know within a kind of an hour you could do most of these kind of phenotyping type trials um, but again this is where you know this type of te technique I think you know if you put it on a, a fixed wing vehicle with a much longer life and if you can figure out you know how to do do tight turns at the end um, you know that might start to scale to kind of a large growing or as uh, I guess the group there pointed out or you know using swarms of these which is also something that's that's very interesting so so let me talk a little bit now about um, some other projects that we're working on and the first this other one is basically on UAV water sampling and again so our goal here is actually to collect water samples with the UAV and and again the challenges here well it's actually worse than flying over crops because if you something goes wrong you fall in the water so we're really uh, working on you know again getting close into the environment um, but not getting too close and being very robust and one of the motivations uh, again locally for this is this is actually um, an area in Nebraska where it's actually a recreation site where there are a bunch of these kind of man-made lakes and and this is the second most popular recreation site in the state um, but it's also right next to the Platte River, which is an important source of water in the region. And what you see is a lot of little lakes, because they were manually dug, dug out when they were kind of building some of the train tracks and railroads in the area for raw materials. Um, but they're not connected together. And it turns out that there have been some toxic algal blooms that have killed dogs and, and things in the past. So now there's a lot of effort that goes into monitoring these, these lakes. And basically, they have to go out and manually collect water samples, which typically entails putting a boat in each of these little lakes. And that ends up taking um, to do even you know half these lakes. So about 10 of these can take uh, 12, 12 to 14 hours. And most of that effort is involved in, in putting boats in and out of the water. So another example is you know during during floods. So this is actually a picture in, from northeastern Nebraska where there were a lot of wildfires. And basically between these two days, it rained. And you can see on the right-hand one, it's really dirty um, from the ash runoff. And the scientists, the water scientists we're working with here are interested in knowing, okay, what, you know, right at this event, they want to get a snapshot of how this, um, you know, propagates throughout the water system. So they want to collect you know, hundreds of samples in many different locations uh, very quickly so that they can kind of develop these snapshots. And, you know, while this is showing, you know, the like ash runoff, um, of course, we're also interested in, you know, how do the fertilizers and other chemicals we're applying to our fields, how do they enter the water systems and propagate through it? And, you know, especially in, in cases like floods, where most of the water scientists, they may have equipment stationed there to automatically sense and collect samples, but during floods, they'll remove that to ensure that the, the, um, their sensors don't get washed away. So how is this done now? Well, largely, this is the method. So manually going out on a boat, um, you know, getting a bucket of water and collecting little samples. Uh, they also, of course, put some sensors in, in the water to measure parameters, dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, temperature, things like this where there are compact inexpensive sensors that they can measure it in the field. 
but a lot of the water analysis for especially you know chemical and biological um, contaminants and features of the water still has to be done at the lab so they're still collecting a lot of water samples now there are of course ways you can mo automate some of this so there are these fixed sam samplers but again during things like floods they take these out um, there also are you know I'm my background is really robotics and you know there are a lot of autonomous boats that can collect water samples and sense but all of these also um, work well you know if you're if you're going to study Lake Michigan, you should definitely put an automated boat in. But for areas like in Nebraska, where we have a lot of a lot of little ponds, lots of places that are critical for for agriculture and other applications, um, we can't afford to put a you know boat in every one of these. So with our kind of UAB, here's this Fremont Lake area again. The the idea is that we can just you know drive into the, to the parking lot in the middle of this area and launch the vehicle from there and it can cover most of these lakes to effectively collect samples. But so what I'm gonna, and I guess some of their requirements, so they don't need a lot of water. So what we're gonna collect is just kind of these 20 milliliter samples. And of course we also need to do some work to make sure that the method of collection, so collecting from the air is not going to bias results. And again, um, similar to that, we're, we're using totally kind of different set of sensors and approaches, but a lot of the conceptual challenges are similar in terms of how do you safely fly just a you know, meter off of the water and, and you know, avoid cross-contamination. We're also very concerned about things like, like wind and ensuring safety. So we use the same kind of base platform as the, in the crop height system, and let me I guess maybe start out by showing a video and if hopefully this video it runs smoothly but there's also a YouTube link up at the, the corner there if you want to want to watch it separately or on your own so this is actually a project that we're collaborating with some scientists at UC Berkeley so this is one of their field reserve sites in California and again in this location kind of in the, the foothills and um, not too far from Berkeley they have a lot of these ponds and here you can see basically we fly down and and dip the pump in the water and then we have these three little vials that we can can fill with water and this is fully autonomous uh, so we're kind of programming in this case a GPS location where we want to go and then we automatically go down to collect collect the samples now one of the, the things um, if you have not done any work and you know this is also uh, important for the crop work is that the the onboard altimeters are basically this pressure sensor they measure air pressure and they don't work very well for maintaining altitude so um, they're fine if you're flying relatively high but over the course of you know just a few minutes they can drift by a meter or more so when we're flying really close we can't rely just on those sensors so we have to add other sensors. Now, just to talk about kind of some of the physical system a little more. So <laughs> at the bottom of that tube you saw going down, uh, we have a very tiny pump that we can we use to um, pump water up into the sample chambers. So we have three of these that have three that are 20 milliliter vials that we can just easily remove. Um, in in between we have a servo that is able to direct the flow of water into any one of those chambers. And importantly, we actually have an intermediate stage where we can flush out uh, the tubing. So whenever we go to a new location, we're actually going to flush out the uh, flush water out for a while to clean out everything so that we're uh, minimizing any chances of, kind of cross contamination. And they're you know easy to remove so that you can collect these three three samples, fly back, um, switch the vial, and switch the batteries, and be ready to go again. Now, the way we maintain height is we've actually added a pair of these ultrasonic rangefinders um, that give us some redundant height information. Also along the tube, we have 
I mean, basically expose water that we wires that we use as conductivity sensors so that we can actually tell how deep the tube is in the water. And and I won't go into the details, but basically we're fusing all of this information together to get a very accurate height estimate. And we've done a fair amount of experimental validation. So we've um, basically looked at how how well we can collect samples, um, also comparing them to manual methods. So can we actually collect the do the samples we collect match those of manual ones? And it turns out that we do fairly well. So there are some things that that change, like the temperature of the sample may change just during transit time. Also, things um, actually surprisingly, we did an experiment where we measured dissolved oxygen both at the source of collection and also back at shore after we collected it. And it turned out that actually stayed the same. So we're not really stirring up these samples too much to change the gases in them. And then one of the key things is, of course, operation in the wind. And, and so we're able to um, effectively sample um, even in kind of these five meter per second winds, which out on the water with the vehicle flying out there, it's, you know, that's more than, than we thought we would want to do. Um, but we this this figure shows basically how different altitudes above the water impact the sampling success rate, and you can see that when we're just 0.72 meters above the water, we are we get kind of good success rate throughout. Now um, that is a little closer than we would like to be. I mean that doesn't feel comfortable as kind of a backup pilot who's um, you know, may attempt to take over if something goes wrong. Um, but even up to you know, this 0.92 meters, we can, we can fairly effectively sample in different wind conditions. Um, we've also done some work. So this is uh, some, some recent work showing data sets we collected where instead of just collecting um, samples from the surface, what we actually did is we had a temperature sensor and we adjusted the, the depth of that sensor. So by changing the altitude of the vehicle um, from zero meters to two and a half meters so that we could actually um, basically get these full full kind of transects of the water. And and so this this figure shows kind of data from, from an area where we um, collected six of these kind of depth transects. And we actually did comparisons of this compared to static arrays to look at how both the vehicle flying over the water may stir up the water or otherwise impact it. And, and it turns out that you know, it didn't seem to impact the mixing of the water and certainly not, not deeper down. So, so this again is a way that we may, you know, we can basically quickly measure lakes and, and determine really their, their 3D structure much better which again is something that's very time consuming and difficult for scientists to do right now and is therefore something that they they really don't do very often. Um, now, I can show you this is uh, another video showing, showing flight and this is actually an application where instead of collecting water samples, um, what they're looking for here is actually the villagers of zebra mussels which is an invasive species, and, and the villagers are the little babies. Um, and Nebraska is actually, we've been fortunate until recently, we didn't have these in many lakes, but now they're starting to be discovered. And this is the kind of existing sampling technique where from shore, you're having to throw in these nets. It can be difficult, dangerous, hard to access. You definitely don't want to put boats in in this case because you can, then you, um, if a lake is contaminated and you'll be spreading this around to other lakes you go to. So in this case, what we were able to do is basically instead of collecting samples of water, we pumped water through a filter. So we could basically collect, um, you know, similar to the kind of um, the tow that the, the scientist was doing, we can collect the, you know, measure the number of villagers in the sample there. So it's overall, um, we've collected hundreds, probably it's now in the thousands of samples, uh, both outdoors and we have an indoor test bed as well. And it is stable in these kind of five meter per second winds. 
and the um, and we've done some pretty good analysis to show that you know these are comparable to kind of the manual samples scientists nor normally take. Um, and we're also you know some of the uses we're looking at um, you know so this is kind of temperature mapping is invasive species. We're also interested in looking at there's some some uh, eDNA techniques where you can actually analyze the DNA in samples of water. Um, also, we are working on, you know, integrating other types of sensors to do in situ measurements um, beyond kind of just the temperature, um, so that you can do more adaptive sampling strategies where you actually will only sample when when you've you know detected some other other trigger like maybe a a um, of oxygen, which may indicate that there there may be some toxic algal blooms in the area. You could then choose to pull there. So, um, so this is what I want to talk about: water sampling. And about all of these, um, I think, especially when you're flying, failures are a part of field robotics. And so I want to talk a little bit now about about uh, some of the things we're doing to try to improve the overall safety of these systems. And for those of you who may not know, this is actually a picture of this DJI drone that was crashed on the White House grounds. And we, of course, have had our share of failures. Um, so this is a, a video showing where we had a failure of a motor to start when we were taking off. And of course, um, when we're right by the water, bad things happen. Um, we were able to actually uh, fully recover this vehicle. Um, fortunately, for kind of FAA reasons, we were operating with a tether at this location. So we were able to pull it out. And after many hours of disassembly and drying, it, it worked again. But there are a lot of failures that happen in field robotics. And I would say that you know there are maybe four classes of failures. So some are purely hardware. Things break, sensors break. Um, I think some of the other challenges, of course, as I've been talking about, kind of the environmental challenges. And I think one of the big challenges with the environment is that, um, you know, we are also guilty of this. We develop our systems in kind of an indoor test bed, and we do things like blow fans at them. But when we go out in the field, things are just different. And and as a programmer, you know, we don't always, we aren't always able to, you know, figure out how things are going to be different outdoors. We try, but we fail. And so this is the cause of failures. Also, users are just uh, certainly, uh, we've, we've all crashed vehicles because we've inputted the wrong command. And, and then there are the more traditional you know, bugs in the software that can cause, cause problems. So one project that we've also been working on is basically a method to overall kind of automate the Kind of detection of errors and how to improve them. And so in this case, we did this indoors with a, a vehicle moving around and trying to land on this moving platform. Well, that does really well when, you know, when the vehicle is just moving nicely. And what we did is we looked at and we used ROS, this robot operating system, and we analyzed all kind of a lot of data that's being generated from this and passing through the system what we're able to do is infer these invariants. So what it should like look like when it operates correctly. Because when we, in this case, we added a fan on the left-hand side there. And most of the time, our system that worked well crashed. But what we could do is basically from automa automatically analyzing and learning from these successes and failures, we could generate this monitor that could detect when things were proper. So in here, in this case, we broke the platform. Um, and it crashes without our monitor, but with the monitor, it's able to detect that something is wrong, so it should actually abort the landing and take off again. And so this this is um, kind of this general technique that we can apply to any kind of these ROS systems, these robot operating systems. And you know, in in these cases where where we kind of changed the environment or broke things, uh, we went from you know. Uh, only about 20% success to almost 90% success. So this is one of the techniques we've been developing, and and I don't have much time, so let me just kind of skip skip to the kind of end here. But but basically, we're able to detect when there are these violations, when something 
um, anomalous went wrong, and and then take a corrective action. So I think this is a very powerful technique, and and it's one that we're working on extending and also integrating into all of our other field systems to detect these types of, of failures and faults. So let me just quickly talk about one kind of last project that we're doing in the lab that I think it is possibly of interest to this, this community. We're also working on actually wireless power transfer where, where the goal is basically if we have sensors deployed in remote locations, so you have sensors you know, on air, uh, in this case a center pivot system or buried underground or along a bridge, our, what we really want to do is fly out with the UAV, collect the data from the sensors, of course, but also while we're there, we want to recharge the batteries. And the way we're doing this is actually through a wireless power transfer system. So this video shows basically at the top there a, a light that's being um, basically that's representing our sensor where the UAV is actually powering that. So that doesn't have any batteries or anything. Basically, when the, when the UAV gets close enough, it's going to wirelessly transfer power, um, similar to like how you might have an elect electric toothbrush charge, but longer range and more energy. So that while we're collecting the data, we can also charge the sensors. And what we think that this will you know, really enable much longer term sensor deployments where you can, can actually um, you know, embed them in structures, bury them underground, and you won't have to have a big solar panel, you know, in the middle of your field that's, you know, that just doesn't work in agriculture typically. Um, but you can actually charge the sensors wirelessly with this type of approach. So um, we've done done a you know number of uh, small deployments and experiments with this. We can we can transfer kind of the 10 watts, which is just to give you an idea, in the kind of the flight time of the UAV, um, we're able to charge a sensor that, you know, like a AAA battery type of energy transfer. And, you know, that's um, you know, good enough for most of these, these low power remote sensors to, to operate for, you know, months or, or even longer. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway maybe from today, I hope is that, um, hopefully you've, I've convinced you a little bit that UAVs are really promising for agriculture, and they can do more than just these high flying flights. Well, I mean that's certainly what's hot now, and what's uh, what people are are really starting to use them for in agriculture. I think they really have a disruptive potential when you start to bring them even closer into the environment. And of course, you know, ground robots working in the field. I think there's a lot of opportunities for synergy and collaboration between vehicles flying above the canopy and those kind of traversing under it at all stages of growth. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of um, challenges beyond kind of the technical challenges that I talked about today. Uh, so certainly um, public perception. So, you know, privacy is is a big concern for people with drones. I think this is something that in, in agriculture, if you're having the grower is the one who's actually you know, flying these and maybe you're flying with sensors other than cameras. I think there's a way that you can alleviate that. Um, but this is definitely something that, that, you know, as a community, as we're um, kind of developing these types of, of drones and other flying vehicles, I think it's important to be aware of and, and try to be proactive in, in how we interact with the communities. Also in the United States um, and now, you know, increasingly elsewhere, there are um, uncertain but ch and changing regulations, uh, which are are hard to predict. But that's something that we have to be aware of, and is definitely a challenge. Our my group here, we have um, we all my students and myself, we've gone through all the FAA ground school and all the processes to get waivers to fly um, fly legally outdoors. Uh, so these are definitely challenges. And and then of course, there are still a lot of you know, these fundamental challenges in robotics that we need to address to get really close into the environment. And uh, this is just a picture of some of my students and I have a number of grad students and undergrads and I co-direct the lab with uh, another member. Um, so with that, I would be happy to answer some more questions.
and and if you have questions, um, you can also certainly email me offline, and and I'm happy to answer. Okay, so there's a question about which programming languages, tools, libraries to use, what processing units. Yeah, so primarily we're using um, using ROS, so Robot Operating System, as the way we're controlling the vehicle. Now the, the UAVs we're using, we're buying these off the shelf from uh, most of the ones we use are from Ascending Technologies, which is a German company. Um, and so we're not controlling kind of the, or changing the low level flight controllers. But what we are doing is doing kind of this the higher level controls, uh, changing, you know, adding sensors, fusing that with existing data. Um, mostly, so ROS, the easiest thing to program in is uh, C or Python. So we use both. And I think one of the good things about ROS is that it really has a lot of these um, libraries built in for, you know, doing, you know, data fusion and, you know, extracting laser scans and things like that. Um, and I guess in terms of processing units, where we we have a couple of different modes of operation. So when we're doing development, a lot of what we do is we're actually remotely controlling the vehicle over a Zigbee radio link, uh, then with a laptop ground station. And this just makes it easier to, to be you know, adjusting parameters and, and changing changing you know our, our algorithms and approaches. Um, but like the crop surveying, we've fully integrated that. We are currently using an Odroid computer. It's like a kind of like a beefed up Raspberry Pi. Um, so it can easily run ROS. It's able to do all of the um, Laser scan processing and and so forth and collecting collecting camera data as well. Eric, uh, this is a great talk. You know, it's kind of like we got two talks uh, for the price of one. Uh, not only the the, the area of phenotyping, uh, but also the part about the water uh, sample collection. It's uh, very, very interesting. Yes. So, so yeah. thank you very much for that. I'm gonna um, ask people if there is uh, if there are any questions. We've already had a, a, a very intensive discussion. Well, I guess if not, um, that's been great. Sorry, I wanna go ahead, please. Yeah, and as I said, if anybody thinks of any other um, questions, feel free to send me. Um, I guess the link to our website is up at the top of the there. You can find my address there. Uh, it's been a great, great set of questions, and and yeah, I hope to see many of you in person soon too. And uh, if I may, uh, I'd like to congratulate you for breaking the record. We've reached 40. Participants today, and that was the top most attended webinar um, of all the 32 we had so far. So, thank you very much. It's a great topic. Uh, it's drawing a lot of interest. We're going to continue uh, bringing speakers uh, in this topic in the future. With that, uh, let me thank everybody for participating, and we'll see everybody in about a month. Thank you. Thank you.